Doctor, we thank you for taking the time. Uh, we just have a few questions for you. Sure. Um, first and foremost, the record for a new vaccine is four years. Is it possible we can come up with a coronavirus vaccine in 18 months? Well, I'm working day and night to try to make it happen. We're, um, you know, I'm up at four or five in the morning every morning and working late. And our group of scientists, including my science co-partner for the last 20 years, Dr. Mary Elena Batazzi, she's doing the same. And we've got a group of scientists in the lab working day and night. So this is a charge from Dr. Fauci to try to do it. So we're going to try. It's never been done before, uh, but um, uh, we're certainly doing our best. And are you? Our, our vaccine will be one of at least a dozen or more that go into clinical trials uh, uh, over, over this over the course of 2020, and we'll see which ones are the most effective and the safest. Yeah, you came up with a vaccine for SARS a few years ago. Is that the same vaccine that you're going to present now? Well, we have two vaccines. We have a, one that's specifically designed for COVID-19, but the one for SARS looks like it will cross-neutralize the virus and uh, uh, cross-bind. So we have some reason to believe that it could work against COVID-19, and it's already been manufactured. So up to 200,000 doses have already been manufactured. So if it works, it would be great. It would really accelerate things. Are you getting the funding you need for both these vaccines you're working on? Well, we're trying. Uh, we we have some federal funding from the NIH, and but we're mostly raising money privately. Um, so we hopefully can make some couple of announcements on our private funding over the next few days and weeks. But uh, are you encouraged? That's that's been my other act, our other big activity. So I'm simultaneously trying to you know get the vaccines into clinical trials and then raise the money and. And in between talking to the nation on various cable news networks. Are you encouraged about the private money coming in so far? It's, it's coming, uh, not at the level uh, we would like, but it, it's definitely, we're making progress. So we're How all, much money do you need, doctor? Well, uh, we need about another million for the, the vaccine going into phase one trials now, and then we're probably need another four to five million for the other. So it's not a huge. Of money. So it's a lot of money, but it's not a lot of money. So it's uh, it so the vaccine for phase one trial. When, when would you go to phase one? Hopefully by a uh, little later this year, maybe by the fall or earlier. So explain to the public, phase one trial only means just what a few dozen people will will be tested, right? It, it depends. Uh, we're working this out now. It could be a few dozen. It's usually healthy adult volunteers. Uh, that get injected with the vaccine to make certain there's no untoward immediate reaction. And then you expand that in phase two trials to looking at different populations that you may want to vaccinate, such as older Americans or, um, uh, or those with comorbid conditions. And then you have to see if the vaccine actually works in a, in a large phase three trial. The other thing about our vaccine it's a low cost vaccine. Uh, it uses an older technology, the same technology used for the hepatitis B vaccine used all over the world. And uh, so in that sense, it could be one of the first global health vaccines. And now we're hearing terrible reports of COVID-19 racing through Brazil, causing a lot of death and destruction in cities like Fortaleza and Belém, and it's in uh, Ecuador and now Mexico. And we expect it to go into India and Africa later this summer. So that's going to be a devastating disease. So ours is going to be one of the first low-cost global health vaccines. Yeah. Well, so the, and, that, and that's and that's what we do at Texas Children's and Baylor. We have we've always been designing low-cost neglected disease vaccines. So we when we had started this coronavirus vaccine program, we simply used uh, our same approach. So. The phase one trial you're talking about, that's for the coronavirus, yes? Well, all of our vaccines go through phase one, two, and three trials. But for the coronavirus, yes, that phase one trials, we hope will start in the, in the fall. Less than 10% of drugs that enter clinical trials are approved by the FDA. Those odds are not good. No, and that's why it's hard to get people to uh, want to support vaccines. In some ways, it's... Uh, from an investor point of view, it's a nightmare, right? It's 
uh, uh, high attrition rate, long timelines, and it's pretty expensive. Um, there are not many investors, you know, who are willing to take on vaccines. That's why people like Bill Gates are are special because they're one of the few. And we've gotten some people in Houston to support us. And fortunately, Texas Children's and Baylor has been great, and the NIH has been good to us as well. So, so we, you know, it's it's. It's hard work both to do the science and to raise the funds for it, but the goals are very meaningful. So I know I understand there are about 95 vaccines being tested right now around the world. You told the New York Times you need as many horses in the race as possible. That's a lot of horses. Well, all those aren't real horses. A lot of those are, um, are still testing in animals. We finished our testing in animals uh, so uh, that what we're, you know, there's, there's not going to be 95 vaccines going into clinical trials. I would say, you know, maybe a dozen to two dozen here in the U.S., a handful in China, a handful in, in the European countries. So it won't be anything near that. So your vaccine here in Houston will go to be one of the a dozen or so in, a, in the states that goes to clinical trial. That's our hope. Uh, and, you know, we'll, we'll engage the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to present our dossier, and hopefully we'll get the green light to move that into clinical trials. When will you know about getting the green light? What's the timeline? You know, late, later in the year, later summer, fall. Later, so a few months away. Yeah. yeah. Today, Houston announced... And the, other, the other thing we've done, which is quite interesting, is we've now, we announced it last week, a new partnership with a fantastic organization called PATH, P-A-T-H. And they are Seattle-based. Uh, they've also been heavily supported by the Gates Foundation. They developed the meningococcal A vaccine for Africa and the malaria vaccine for Africa. And so they have a, a lot of clout and horsepower and for advancing vaccines in resource-poor countries. And because ours is a global health COVID-19 vaccine, we've now engage with them, the partner, and we're working together on this. Today, Houston announced six more deaths uh, from COVID-19, including the first child in the Houston area, a boy between 10 and 19 years old. What, what's your assessment of that, uh, those numbers? Well, we, we I anticipate that we're going to be seeing COVID-19 cases continue in Houston throughout the summer and fall. Remember what the mathematical models told us uh, from the University of Washington, the IHME, they said we had to maintain strict social distancing uh, throughout the month of May. And, um, but we weren't prepared to do that. And I understand why, I understand why we have to open up the economy, but you know, it does carry consequences and that will mean we'll continue to see COVID-19 cases. The thing that I'm worried about is whether we'll uh, implement the necessary public health infrastructure to keep Houstonians safe. So but, how do you do that? I mean, we've well, opened well, the by that, I mean, in Texas. Well, by, by that, I mean, we've already, the decision's already made that we're going to uh, relax social distancing in a number of venues. The big concern I have is at the workplace. Uh, we want to make certain that people feel comfortable going back into the workplace and making certain that their colleagues do not have asymptomatic COVID-19, right, that they could contract it from. So that requires implementing a pretty substantial health system in Houston of, of testing in the workplace, of doing the contact tracing, of doing what we call syndromic surveillance, uh, public health messaging, and creating epidemiologic models. So it's a lot of work. And it's and we've got to do it now. We've got to do it because we were already relaxing social distancing. So it's going to be a big challenge for us. Some of the things that are working, there are a couple of things for us that are working in our favor. I think one of them is the fact that a lot of the evidence shows that uh, high population density is a risk factor. And that's why things were, went so terribly wrong in New York City and, and Boston. Um, is anyone who's been stuck in traffic knows in Houston, uh, we're pretty spread out, so not nearly as dense. On the other hand, there are some of the low income neighborhoods in Houston are have a lot of density. So I'm yeah. worried about the So tell me this, Doctor. The, 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 the other let me just say the other 
thing that may work in our favor is there's some evidence that uh, uh, lots of sunlight and humidity may work in our favor as well. And we certainly have that as we move into the summer months. So there, yeah. there are worrisome things and there are things that may help us as well. Yeah. Um, what's the magic number for a comfortable amount of testing for Houston, do you think, that would make a difference? Uh, I, I don't know. I can just tell you right now it's too little. Um, you know, uh, it's too little by what? 10 percent, 50 percent? What? Well, right right now, Texas as a whole ranks about 49th um, among you among states. So we're, not per capita. A, we're, yeah. we're, we're pushing it. Right. And um, so uh, I don't have that number in terms of the number of tests and and I think it's, a, it's not the way I like to look at it, because uh, it's not just number of testing, it's how you're implementing it. And, and, and not just doing random testing, but testing in, in the workplace, I think is gonna be absolutely essential in putting a system in place. And unfortunately, we're not getting a lot of guidance from the CDC, uh, and we don't know why either, it's because they're not creating the documents and, and the system or it's being su suppressed. So. What's happened now is uh, several universities, Harvard, Columbia, uh, Georgetown universities have now created pretty detailed guidance documents for the workplace. So I think what's gonna happen is some of the larger companies you know, are going to have the resources to put all of those things in place, uh, meaning the employee testing. What I'm most worried about are some of the smaller businesses. I mean you know, dry cleaners and smaller restaurants. I mean, restaurants, yeah, sure. So, so they're going to need help and, uh, and, and to help, help them figure that out. Is that part of the infrastructure you were talking about earlier to kind of support this reopening of the economy? Yeah, absolutely. So the thing that I'm worried about is I understand, I get it. You know, my son's, you know, in, in the oil and gas industry, he's a petroleum engineer, and he's seeing – you know, how the, the hit that the industry's taken and Houston's taken, but the, but recognize that unless we have that health system in place, uh, the economic recovery won't work or it won't be sustained. That because more people will start going back into the hospitals and ICUs and then things will collapse uh, again. And, I, I'm, and I'm, I'm concerned uh, about that happening. And I, you know, I've had a lot of good conversations with the mayor and Mayor Turner and he totally gets it. And, uh, and the office of the County judge does too. Uh, so everybody's working hard to try to put that infrastructure in place. So Texas reopened slowly last week. At what point down the road will you know if we're going to have a problem from that, if at all? Well, the numbers will start going up uh, through testing, um, but unfortunately, sometimes the only way you really wind up knowing, and this is what happened in New Orleans, this is what happened in New York, is when you start seeing patients uh, going into intensive care units. And, uh, and that would be tragic because it, once you find out by that mechanism, it's, it's almost too late. Because and at what point would you know? Like th we're talking about three weeks from now, four weeks? I don't think so. I think, you know, and that's the other worry that I have is that um, we're going to start seeing some states open up and, and things are going to seem fine for maybe a month, maybe two months. But if it starts to happen, some models say it's going to go towards into August or, or even early fall when we'll start seeing that big surge again. And and that's a concern as well, because that'll be in the weeks going up to the 2020 presidential election, where it could be a very destabilizing time in this country, especially if there's, um, uh, you know, if the polls go down for some of our elected leaders and they deflect and we'll see. I think, I think we're just going to have to be very mindful of this situation and, uh, you know, stay in touch with your local news and, uh, listen very carefully and, and talk to your employer about how you can have that testing in place uh, in the workplace. So I want to be clear here. You believe if there's a problem from reopening, we might not know until August in right. Texas and Houston? That, that's right. That's okay. Right. So you're talking two months, That's three right. months. That's right. Okay. And 
how long are we going to be now, dealing no, with? Let me, let me let me qualify that. You know, okay. Uh, before I get ahead of myself here, uh, this is a new virus, right? So, and we've never been through a whole year of this virus. We're still learning about it. And so, you know, I have to be humble too. Um, these, these are based on models, math, math, you know, epidemiologic models. And the epidemiologic models are based on assumptions, which frankly are not robust. They're not robust because we're learning so much about this virus, uh, the, the assumptions are by no means perfect. They have flaws in them as well. So we don't really know, but I, I think we have to anticipate the possibility. Uh, I think one of the things we we're seeing, I think that's likely is we'll see a peak next winter. Uh, that a number of models, especially the Harvard models show that. The thing that I'm concerned about in the more near term is another peak in between now and winter. So a couple, couple, two final questions, doctor. Um, I get a sense there's a bit of uh, fatigue with the virus among people getting out in public, uh, maybe more so than, say, city leaders would like. What do you say to people about that? I'd say I, I get it. You know, I, you know, I, I, I understand. You know, it's, it's asking a lot. This is, goes against their nature, right, especially – a place city like Houston, right? Where, you know, Houston's a very friendly city. People are, people are kind, people like to get together, people enjoy um, their activities together. This is painful and I, and I totally understand how, uh, you know, being shut in for a good chunk of the spring has been really tough on, on people. And for some it's more than just tough, it's been life-threatening. I mean, these are, you know, we have heads of households, right, who, you know, who if they don't physically don't show up in the workplace, you know, they're not getting a paycheck. So this right. is, this is uh, a lot of hardship. So I, you know, I can't really fall too much any elected leader making decisions, right? I mean, everyone's trying to do the right thing. And, you know, in terms of opening up or not opening up or, or what you do if you're going to try to uh, jumpstart the economy. I, all I would say is I, I understand the, the pressures to uh, relax social distancing and get people back into the workplace and get a life again. All I would say is recognize that if we, that it's imperative that we put in that public health infrastructure uh, to make certain it has a hope of being sustainable. How much longer are we going to be dealing with this realistically? Hard to say. Um, I often take people back to the 1918 flu pandemic. Um, we call it the 1918 flu pandemic, but when Woodrow Wilson got sick with the flu at the Treaty of Versailles, it was in 1919. So that was a year later. And many people feel that it didn't really go away till 1920. And in some parts of the US, like in Pennsylvania, it was around to 1922. So, so you think, so realistically, so the, so we could, could be talking be, about what two years, two three years, but it won't be it won't be like it is now. It it could come in waves, and so the recognition that there could be months where, you know, we can, you know, be out and about and be in the workplace, but there may be times where things get bad again, and possibly next winter when we'll have to reimplement some of that social distancing. It's just it's. It's going to be a new way, you know, we'll never forget this, right? I mean, we're going to talk to our kids and grandkids about this time, like our grandparents talked to us about the 1918 flu pandemic. It's going to be a very transformative event. All I would say is um, uh, we will adapt. Uh, businesses will op reopen. They'll continue. I also like to, th for some people also, it might even be an opportunity to, reset their lives to um, uh, to rethink, you know, what's meaningful to them, what's important to them in terms of their, their job and their employment and mm. what they're doing. It and, sounds like, and, and maybe you want to, you know, maybe you want to think about educate, you know, getting another degree or education. So this is mm. a time where, you know, take, take advantage of that too and, and use it to be reflective and think about your future. It sounds like we're in for, it sounds like we're in for a cycle of, relaxing restrictions and then restricting again yes 
I, I think yes, I think that's definitely a possibility. The hope is the periods of relaxing the restrictions are going to be much longer and more sustained than those peaks when we may have to re-implement social distancing. And in the meantime, we rush to get a vaccine. And your your well, well you I, earlier, I, would, I would I would say this too. You know, we have to be careful about using that term rush and. Quite honestly, I've not been very happy with some of the language coming out of the White House because it sends a mixed message. So we're hearing the project labeled Operation Warp Speed and some of the some of the drug companies and the biotechs. Pandemic speed is what I heard. Boasting they're going to have them in weeks and, and that sort of thing. And that's very damaging, too, because, you know, we have a very aggressive anti-vaccine movement, especially here in Texas. And, uh, and I go up against this because I have a daughter with autism and I've written a book about Rachel in Houston called Vaccines Did Not Cause Rachel's Autism. And the other tenet, other, the other assertion they make besides claiming that vaccines cause autism, which they don't, is that we rush vaccines, that, they're, that we don't adequately test them for safety. Yeah. That's also not true. So, I, I w- so the reality, but what's the reality? Even if we... Even if we get a vaccine, no, but, no, my point. My point is, some of the language being used is harmful. Yeah, because it's sending the wrong message that somehow what we're doing is rushing a vaccine before it's ready, and that's not the case. What? So, what's the fastest you think we could be ready? I mean, I know it's a guess. Uh, you know, I'm. You know, as I say, we're working day and night to meet Dr. Fauci's uh, charge uh, to have it by next year. Uh, well, so we'll do our best. So sometime in 2021, if we're lucky. Well, more than lucky if sort of the stars align and everything work, works out. Dr. Hotez, always a pleasure. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, uh, I, I hope, uh, I'd like to you know, end on a message of, of optimism. I, you know, I think it's important that we not sound too apocalyptic. Uh, we have a good, we have a lot going for us here in the city. You know, it's, uh, We've got a lot of smart engineers that I think can help us with some of the uh, to streamline contact tracing to uh, implement new forms of syndromic surveillance. We need to tap our intellectual horsepower. We're not passive in this. Houston can do things that no other city can do. We certainly hope you are right. Thank you, doctor. Thank you.